Forty years ago this weekend, 58 people set out by Mass and Park Christian Church in Quincy held crossing first worship service. Four years later, the crossing is a congregation approaching 7,000 worshiping in nine locations in three states. Some of them, original 58, were in committed and active in the crossing ministry. We had moved to Quincy uh, in uh, 1969, so we'd been here for about five years. Uh, and uh, the church, Madison Park, had decided that they were going to start a church on the south end of town. We lived out in that general area. We had a lot of really good friends at Madison Park, so it was hard to leave, but we felt it was the thing we needed to do. We didn't even have a church building yet when we went out there. It's, uh, we met in the Monroe School until the church was <laughs> had enough roof and <laughs> sidewalls that we could use it. We had always worked in the church and we were excited about a new church in the south end of town and we just wanted to be a part of it. We weren't anxious to leave, but it was exciting to think about being able to go to the, to the south end of, uh, of Quincy uh, and to be able to basically start a church with a bunch of, really overall, a bunch of young couples just to kind of see what we could do uh, for the Lord out there. And it was a good feeling knowing that we were spreading out. He called us into the front of the church and we stood, and I can remember just quivering with nervousness. We, could we really do this? Um, so I was scared, but I also was excited. It was a real adventure for all of us. It was exciting to be on the other side of working as an adult with kids and seeing them grow. I grew up in a small church and I thought it'd really be neat to be in a, in a small church, but it isn't very small anymore. <laughs> My grandparents actually were incredible, uh, absolutely incredible uh, influences in my life and really were able to, uh, you know, be just great examples. Looking back, I think uh, I think we became internalized, and there wasn't a division, and uh, that was a hard time. The commitment of just not not giving up, and of course we had good people. I mean, it had nothing to do with our people. It's just we just couldn't get, we just couldn't move the ball, and we were stagnant for. I would say for at least five years. So we just felt that we were kind of obligated to, to stay and to try to see it through. And uh, about that time, time, some things started to change. Uh, and from there, we've kind of been on a roller coaster ever since. It was tough sometimes to um, see things kind of sliding a little bit, and yet it was. Um, it was determination to not give up and continue on what God had started. I think that provided a vision that, uh, or ex exposed a vision that we had been looking for but didn't see. And as they say, the rest is history. It's that move from a religion to a relationship and go deep in prayer. And that's, that's where it turned around. Of course, Don, when we came to the high school, why Don trailered all of the instruments back and forth, and we were busy all the time. It almost makes you want to cry because it's just, it's amazing that God has let us live to see what he had planned to begin with, that we couldn't have any way of knowing um, that this was, this was here. We don't even know where it's going to stop. We're just still on a roll. God just has these grander ideas that we don't see when we're in the midst of them. But to think that we got to be a part, one little cog in this wheel, uh, and participate in this, it's unbelievable. And when we pass communion and we look down the row and we see all the people, um, yeah, if, if you see the two of us on either side of an aisle, we usually have tears in our eyes because we're so, uh, so in awe of God and the way he's made this work. It's a joy to to see what God has done. 
people being faithful and uh, us reaching out to those who do, don't know Christ. It's tremendous what's <laughs> happened. I mean, it's unbelievable. Great. It's the great. greatest thing you ever could think of. God is so good. I know that God had hands and was in every step in everything that we did financially as well as spiritually and that uh, he was there every week there's more people in one row in this auditorium than we had on average at Payson Road on a on a given Sunday so it's just it's pretty amazing but then I think the the real it's not just the numbers that we have but I think the the exciting thing about seeing our people I mean when you're standing back and and you're looking at people and of course they're in the process of worship uh, and you and you and, and you know that so many of them are new Christians or people who are seeking to me that's that's the real that's the real thrill and the real satisfaction is is the success of reaching lost people and to be able to disciple those people. Thanks, Mama and Papa, for making it church for me. Church, how are you doing? You doing good? Happy 40th anniversary. Doesn't seem like you've been here for 40 years, does it? No, but uh, we have been a church honoring the Lord and serving the Lord for 40 years, and it's awesome to be able to celebrate that moment. And I want to welcome uh, all of our campuses that are joining. I want to welcome Macomb. I want to welcome Kirksville, 929, Pittsfield. Of course, I want to welcome Hannibal, Missouri. Yeah, absolutely. I want to welcome Lima. I want to welcome Mount Sterling. And this weekend, I want to welcome our ninth campus, and that is the Keokuk campus. We are in Iowa. Praise God for that. That is awesome. You know, we as a church have a great story to tell, and uh, you are all a part of what makes that story great because it's been awesome to watch what God did out of the faith of about 58 people that stepped out uh, that were encouraged to do that by their home church into a completely uncharted territory and then stay the course. Like one family that you saw there, that's four generations, four generations of people that uh, have gone through the crossing and been a part of the crossing from the very first day. And, uh, you know, I know that God isn't through. I think of what he's done in the last 40 years and I think about what do the next 40 years look like? And all we have to do is make sure that we are walking with Him. All we need to do is make sure that we are looking where God is working and then going and joining there. And as long as that happens, God's going to do incredible things. We just have to keep cooperating with Him. You know, today we're starting a new series. It's called His Story. And uh, it's going to last for 16 weeks and it's all going to be about the life of Christ. I'm really excited about that. And it connects us to last year. Last year, one of the most incredible things that we did was we went through a series called The Story. And it was the Bible from cover to cover. It was 32 weeks long. And I don't think that very many people ever had the opportunity to study the Bible uh, like that. Like from one cover to the other cover. And understand how all of these individual stories... Uh, biographies, all this history, all these different things all contribute to a single story about God redeeming man. But the key component of that, whole, that, that the larger, the story, is the story of Jesus Christ because he was the point and is the point of the whole Bible. And so even though we only got to spend a few weeks uh, just talking about the life of Christ last year, this year we're going to really drill down into that and one of the best things that we learned 
in that whole series, uh, some of you may be new and, and uh, you may not remember that series, but uh, for those of us that went through it, one of the best things was understanding the difference between the upper story and the lower story. And what I mean by that is that God has always had an upper story, and He lives in that upper story. And uh, in that upper story, He has got an incredible plan for your life and for my life. He's had that plan from the very beginning, and it's an awesome plan. Not to do you harm, but to do you good. And it's good from God's point of view, good from God's perspective. It's so awesome to know <coughs> that I have a purpose and that I have a plan that's set out for me. In the book of Hebrews it says, Let us run with endurance the race that is marked out for us. In Ephesians 2.10 it says, We're his workmanship made in Christ unto good works that he's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. God has an upper story for you. But you know what? We live down in this lower story, don't we? We do. We live down in that daily grind where all of our circumstances and all the situations of life really kind of get to us. And sometimes we get lost down in that lower story. It's where we lose track uh, of keeping our eyes up. You know, the Bible says, lift up your eyes and lift up your heads because we want to continually see that upper story, but sometimes we get lost down in that lower story and, and we can get completely lost in it and, and, it, and just, just a, in the darkness of it. But God is always there and He's always trying to lift us out of that lower story back into His upper story. And so when we learn about Jesus, so much of what we read in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so much of that has to do with the lower story. You see, the way that God connected with us through Jesus is that Jesus became a human being, God became a man, and He came down and He lived in the middle of the lower story. And as He lived in that lower story, He was pulling us up to His upper story. I mean, you think about the ministry and the life of Jesus as a whole. You think about him teaching. Well, what was he teaching through? He was teaching through our ignorance. That's our lower story, that ignorance. You think about him healing. He was healing through our lower story, all of our diseases, our pain, our shortcomings. You think about what he was doing, uh, even dying. When he died on the cross, why was he dying? He was dying for our lower story. He was dying for our sins, not his sins. He never sinned. And so, so much of Jesus' life and his biography, they're in the lower story. But that is not where his story begins. Unlike us, unlike us, our story begins down in the lower story. His story begins in the upper story. So, this is the reading guide. Did you all get one of these? you have one of these? Clap if you have one of these. All right, good. I need everybody to have one of these, okay? This is really important as we go through this series that you read through all these passages of Scripture. Now, that might sound like a little bit intimidating, but like today, uh, it would take you probably less than five minutes to read through all the passages that would prepare you for today's sermon. But they're incredibly important words, even though it would only take that short amount of time for the assigned passages in your reading plan. They will be the most profound, most mysterious, and most glorious words that you'll hear in the whole series. Because they begin in the upper story. God is showing us where the starting place had to be. What He's going to do is give you and I a starting place for something that goes beyond understanding so that we can understand it. Now, let me explain that. And first of all, what I want to do is I want to read the first part uh, of, the, of the assigned passages. It's in the book of John. In the book of John, starting in verse 1 of chapter 1, it says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. 
in him was life. And that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. Down in verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was, which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, but, nor of human decision, nor of a husband's will, but born of God. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. <coughs> and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. What is John saying here? Those are very big words, very lofty words. But I'm going to explain what John is saying in three words. Ready? Jesus is God. Sink, let it sink in. Jesus is God. As a matter of fact, the entire book of John is a book that proves that Jesus is God. It approaches the whole point of who Jesus is from the upper story. It tells you what his name was before his name was Jesus. What was his name? The Word of God. Where was the Word of God? He was with God in the beginning, right? What did the Word of God do? Everything that has been made was made by Him and for Him. But I thought Jesus started out <coughs> in a little barn in Bethlehem. Jesus came to that barn in Bethlehem, but He didn't start there. He has always been there because Jesus is God. Down in verse 14 it says what? And the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the, where this journey has to begin with you and with me. We have to understand that truth first. Now, I want you to think about it. I want you to think about that huge statement I just made Jesus is God. And let me ask you a question. Do you understand God? Do you? I'm going to ask myself that question. Do I understand God? The answer is no. How could I? How could I understand? How could it ever be possible for me to understand God? How could someone so limited as me understand something so limitless as God? Eternal God, all-knowing God, all-powerful God, ever-present God, holy God, indescribable God. I can't. I cannot understand Him. The Bible is very clear that I can't. As high as the heavens are above the earth, God says, so are my thoughts over your thoughts. It's like the bacteria on the glass slide looking through the wrong end of the microscope trying to understand the scientist. You just can't. I mean, what are we in comparison to God? That's why this first sermon is so important. Because the understanding of God can only come in one direction, from one source. And that is from being in an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the bridge of understanding between man and the created, the child of God, and God Himself. That's why Jesus came, to create this bridge between God and man. A bridge that was necessary because of the gap that had been created between God and man, because of sin. So knowing Jesus and understanding Jesus is the only pathway we have to understand God. And knowing Jesus requires us to start in the upper story 
where God comes to earth. Jesus is God communicating with us. It's, cre- it's, it's God creating a common understanding so that there is some sort of a possibility of a relationship. That's why he's called the Word of God. Because he's God's communication to us in physical form, in real life, in flesh and blood. And so what God does through Jesus is he bridges the gap of ignorance. He bridges the gap of sin. He bridges the gap of death. And he does it all in Jesus. So, how do I know that Jesus is God? Well, I've already given you one way I know this. I know that Jesus is God because the Bible says he is. And I believe that the Bible is true. So if you believe that the Bible is true, you're going to have to believe that Jesus is God. Now this is interesting. How many of you ever saw the movie The Da Vinci Code? Did you ever see that movie? The the old guy that was Gandalf in another movie was trying to prove to everybody that nobody really understood that Jesus was a god or deity until the Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea, like in the late 300s, right? Well, that isn't true, because here we're reading the book of John, and the book of John was written before 100 AD, and John knew Jesus, he was the closest friend of Jesus, and he's saying Jesus is God. He's not the only one that says that Jesus is God. The other apostles say that Jesus is God as well. <coughs> In a moment, I'll be reading from the Hebrew writer who says Jesus is God. And uh, I'll be reading from the Apostle Paul who says that Jesus is God. And every, uh, every early church father, uh, from the time of the last writing of the New Testament book all the way to those creeds, was saying that Jesus is God. You can read them all. There was no misunderstanding about that truth and there should be no misunderstanding about that truth today the bible is very clear that jesus is god look at the words of the apostle paul in uh, in colossians 1 15 to 18 colossians 1 15 to 18 this is what it says talking about jesus he is the image of the invisible god (coughs) sounds like jesus Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. That's what Jesus said. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in Him all things are held together. Do you think the Apostle Paul's being pretty clear about Jesus being God? I do. I, I think he's being pretty clear. Look at verse 18. It says, And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have supremacy. Jesus is God. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The writer of the Hebrews says this about Jesus. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through prophets, and many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. You know, scientists do not know why an atom doesn't fly apart. Why neutrons and protons revolve around the nucleus without flying apart. But I know why. Because Jesus holds it together. By the sheer power of his deity, he holds all matter together. Matter is not a difficult thing for Jesus because he can create something out of nothing. Because he is 
the creator. The Bible says that he was there. That's why in Genesis chapter 1, it says, let us make man in our image. It's why the Hebrew word for God is in the plural, Elohim, instead of Eloah. Deep stuff, huh? Jesus is God. How about that? If you walk out of here, of any of our locations, at the end of this sermon, <coughs> and someone says, hey, what did you learn in there? You just need to say three words. Jesus is God. <clears throat> that's what I learned. I know that's true. The Bible proclaims it. Now, the Bible doesn't just proclaim it. It proves it. Now, there's lots of places where the Bible proves this. And uh, there, there are lots of examples that I could give. I'll just give you one. I'll just give you one. There are a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the birth of Christ that happened years before he was born, written by people who were not even in the same culture as Jesus, thousands of years before Jesus, start in Genesis 3.15, 12.3, 28, 49.10, I mean all the way back. And when we were doing the story, we learned a lot of that, right? Stuff written about Jesus way before he was born, a thousand years before Jesus was born. David gave a full description of what crucifixion would be like. And now Jesus would die by crucifixion before crucifixion was even a form of execution. Psalm 22, you can just read that. There's lots of that in the Bible. But I want you to just think about eight Eight prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the birth of Christ. Because there's no way that Christ, Jesus Christ, could engineer the, the facts of his birth. Could you do that? This is where I plan on being born. This is who I plan my parents would be. You know, and this is where, this is where I'm going to grow up, and this is what I'm going to do. I mean, you can't do that. Nobody can do that. Of course, God could do that right? And the odds of Jesus being able to fill, fulfill eight prophecies concerning his birth is 1 times 10 to the 54th power. What does that mean? It means the odds would be a 1 and 54 zeros. It would be so much easier for you to win the lottery than for any of those eight prophecies to come true in Jesus Christ. But Jesus did not fulfill eight prophecies concerning his birth. He fulfilled over 300. You've got to be pretty ignorant to not understand that the Bible not only proclaims that Jesus is God, but it proves that Jesus is God over and over and over again. So, I remember the old hymn that says, You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. So you can say, well, I know this subjectively. But I don't only know it subjectively. I also know it objectively. Because I can read. And this Bible tells me and proves to me that Jesus is exactly who the Bible says He is. And that's what the Bible says he is. The Bible is very clear about the Trinity. Very clear about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we misunderstand Jesus because of his humanity, because he was Son of God and Son of Man, that we want to concentrate on the lower story. I understand that. It makes sense to me. But he is God. So let me ask the next question. How do I know Jesus is God? I think I've answered that one. The second one would be, why would God become Jesus? <laughs> why would he do that? So that in knowing Jesus, I could know God. So that in knowing Jesus, I could know what is unknowable. I could understand what was ununderstandable. So that I could be in relationship with someone who was higher than me than the heavens are above the earth. That's why God would become Jesus. So that he could bridge the gap. The gap that sin created between myself and God. And set me free 
from the slavery of sin and death. So in knowing him, I could know that he loves me. That he loves me. And I could begin to start to love him back. In Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, the Apostle Paul gives a teaching on what Jesus actually did. And I, uh, how he came from heaven to earth, I want you to hear this. It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, Jesus is God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he had all the power and all the equality with God. He was sitting on the throne, but he was willing to give it up. And it says, but made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus was God who became a man, who humbled himself, and the way that God describes the level of humility is he calls it becoming nothing. Made himself nothing. Took on the form of a servant, made in human likeness, in flesh and blood. And humbled himself even to the point of death. Why? So that he could pay your debt, my debt. A debt I could never repay, that I owed God. The soul that sins, it shall die. The Bible was clear. And so God is going to keep his word. And he's going to be consistent with himself. Because he is a righteous God and a holy God. And he demands it, righteousness and holiness. But he is not only that. He is not only the sovereign God. He is also a loving God. And so his sovereignty demands that a price be paid. But his love demands that he pays the price himself. And what we could never do, he did. Why did God become Jesus? Ultimately, so that he could pay our debt and set us free. Back to Colossians, verse 19, chapter, chapter 1. It says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's what he did. That's what he did for us. So, if Jesus is God, what does that mean? What does that mean to you and me? This is what it means. It means that all that he said and all that he did is absolutely true. Everything he said about you and me, it's completely true. Everything he said about himself is completely true. What he told us was in our future. That's completely true. That there's a real heaven and a real hell. That's completely true. That our lives are hopeless 
unless we stand on the rock of Jesus Christ, is completely true. That God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance is completely true. The fact that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life is absolutely, completely true. The fact that he is patient with us, that he's here right now, that he doesn't want any of us to have an eternity that we spend without him in hopeless, dark separation from him. That's completely true. And if that stuff isn't true, if Jesus is not God, then none of it is true. He's the world's biggest liar. He's got to be one or the other. The story of Jesus, his story, is God's final plea for his children to come home. It's his final plea for you to come home. For you to know who you are. Whose you are. How much he loves you. To what extent he loves you. To know how far he's willing to go. To rescue you and me. It's God the Father calling to his children, saying, come home. He calls us to the upper story. And that upper story leads all the way to the gates of heaven. We're moving to a time of decision.